Okay. Um, so if we can have the people online introduce themselves, that would be great. And I'll go down the list as I see it. So Amanda, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Hi, I'm Amanda from the city of Newport News, uh, Waterworks. Uh, this is my first meeting. So just kind of listening in. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thomas. Uh, Tom Collickhill, James City County. Thank you. William. This is uh, Will Knuckles with the Town of Colonial Beach Planning Commission. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Alyssa. Hi, this is Alyssa Flat. I am the CRS coordinator for the city of Norfolk. Great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Ben. Ben McFarlane. Ben added a, a note to the chat. He has no microphone. Oh, no microphone. Sorry about that. I'm not looking at the chat that much. Oh, so Ben McFarland's with the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission for those who do not know. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, Brandy. Hi, and good morning. This is Brandy Buford with Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation. Thank you. Brian. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Rawl with the City of Alexandria, Stormwater Management Division. Thank you for joining us this morning. Christy. Hi, good morning. Christy Parrish with James City County Zoning. Awesome. Danielle. Hi, this is Danielle Curtis from Henrico County. Thank you. Daryl. Daryl Walker, City of Petersburg. Great. Debbie. Debbie Messmer, the State Hazard Mitigation Officer for VDEM. Great, thank you. Elizabeth? Hi, Elizabeth, with the Environmental Defense Fund's Virginia Coast and Watersheds team. Thank you. Emily, great to see you this morning. Emily Schmidt, um, I'm the CRS specialist for Virginia communities. So I'll be working with you guys on your CRS cycle visits and any modifications you wish to pursue. Great, thank you for joining us this morning. Greta. Uh, Greta Hawkins with the City of Hampton. I'm the CRS coordinator. Uh, I apologize if I don't pronounce this correctly. Jone? Hold on for a second. I don't know if y'all can see me. Hi, I'm Jone Prevost White from the town of Dumfries. Um, we're not in CRS yet, and uh, but I am a certified floor plan manager. Awesome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Uh, Julie. Hi, I am Julie Lomax. Um, I'm the Stormwater Administrator in Downers Grove, Illinois, and I am the Illinois um, CRS Coordinator. Awesome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, Lisa. Lisa is one of our presenters this morning, but I'll go ahead and have her introduce herself. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Lisa Foster, Floodplain Administrator for Pinellas County down in Florida. Happy to be here. Hello, Virginia and Illinois. <laughs> Um, Matt from the city of Norfolk. Hi, I'm Matt Simons. Um, I'm work working for the city of Norfolk's um, Office of Resilience. I'm a coastal resiliency manager. Great. Uh, Matt Dallin. Hello, Matt Dallin with DCR, Coastal Resilience Master Plan. Thank you for being here with us this morning, Matt. Maxine, she's also one of our presenters from Florida, but I'll go ahead and have her introduce herself. Hi, uh, I'm Maxine Moore. I work with Lisa Foster, who just introduced herself. We are down in Florida in Pinellas County, and we're really happy to be here. All right, thank you. Renee. Hi, Renee McKinnon and- Bobby Gellerman, City of Chesapeake, Office of Emergency Management. Great, thank you all for joining us this morning. Rich. Hi, everybody. This is Rich Sabota. I'm the insurance specialist for FEMA Region 3, also the community rating system coordinator for the region. Happy to see you all, and hopefully I can come down and see you in person in the not-too-distant future now that we're allowed to travel. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, we'd love to see you at our next meeting. Um, Tom, or yes, Tom. Tom with Accomack County. 
Someone else said they didn't have a microphone. Oh, I see. No microphone. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us this morning, Tom. Tristan. Hi, I'm Tristan from the city of Norfolk. I'm the floodplain administrator. Thank you. Whitney. Hey, I'm Whitney McNamara with the city of Virginia Beach. And then William. Or did we already do William? William, did you already introduce yourself earlier? I know it came out of order for a second. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I did. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, I think I got through everybody online. Did I miss anyone? I know some people came in while we were doing introductions. I want to make sure we got everyone. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward then. Um, here are our future meeting dates. So Rich, if you can come to one of these, we'd love to have you. Um, so for 2022, our next meeting will be May 25th, 10 a.m. to noon. Um, we are going to continue to do it in a hybrid style. So whatever works best for you all, we'll be doing it here in person in this room. And then we'll be also doing it on Zoom. And then those are the rest of the dates um, for 2022 as well as 2023. As always, we'll send these um, slides around at the end of the meeting. So I know I see some of you all taking notes of when the next dates are, but we'll make sure this goes out in an email as well. Um, confirmed CFM CECs, we've confirmed the ones from the past three meetings. So you all will be getting 1.5 credits if you joined us either virtually or in person for the September, November, and January meetings that have happened the past um, three meetings, as well as this meeting. So for the people who are joining us online, just make sure that you all are participating in the polls that are going to come up throughout the meeting, because that is how we can guarantee that you'll get your CFM continue, continuing education credits. So once again, make sure to fill out those polls. And we're actually going to run the first one. I'm going to launch that now. And the poll is just, are you a certified floodplain manager? And for the people in the room, just make sure that you're signed into the sheet back there. Um, if you haven't signed in already, you can do it at the end of the meeting. So as that's going on, I want to go ahead and give let our presenters start um, this morning. So we have a guest presentation on their regional public uh, program for public information, and it's their lessons learned um, down in Florida, and they've already introduced themselves this morning, Lisa Foster and Maxine Moore. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so they can share theirs. Maxine is going to share her screen. Okay. Okay. So thank you all for having us and for your interest in our program. We kicked off our PPI back in 2014 and we were about a half a dozen people and it was only for unincorporated Pinellas County. Uh, Maxine's gonna kind of run you through some of the kind of the demographics of Pinellas County. We, we are a uh, very densely populated county on the coast of Florida and we have several municipalities. So she's gonna talk to you a little bit more about the logistics of going into this multi-jurisdictional um, plan as well as tying that plan into our local mitigation strategy that works as our floodplain management plan. Um, it is a dynamic program. So there is not a static document. Every year we update it and do our annual report, but in addition to that, I would say we are constantly revising our messaging and adding new projects where where needed, depending on uh, you know what arises in the community, whether it be new codes get implemented, new maps come come into play, whatever it might be. So this is a very very dynamic program, and I will I will just leave it with <laughs> with that, and I'm going to let Maxine kind of go through the program overall, and then I'll hop back on at the end, and we can turn it into sort of a roundtable discussion uh, with all of you. I'm curious what all of you are doing, if you have individual community PPIs, if you're even doing a PPI. Um, as you know, this was an activity that was added back in the 2014 CRS manual, and it's, it's really a great program, and it's designed, you know, with the community in mind so that you can cater to the specific needs of your community. And of course, there's a lot of folks there from emergency management, I heard. So it's there's a huge piece of this that is on the emergency management side of the house, which is your flood warning and response messaging. And some of that is targeted messaging. So Maxine, I will let you take it away and kind of run through the program so that they can wrap their head around it. And then we'll, we'll circle back and, and have a little conversation. Perfect, thank you for that, Lisa. 
Mm -hmm. So as Lisa stated, um, and was stated earlier, my name is Maxine Moore. I'm a floodplain technician. Um, it's just Lisa and I in our floodplain um, area here, but we work really closely with multiple different counties um, and also multiple different departments within our county. So it's, it's very broad, uh, as I'm sure you guys are aware. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Pinellas County. So as you can see, um, we're here in Florida and we are a peninsula within a peninsula. Our population is close to a million, uh, so 959,000. We're the second smallest county in size for the state of Florida, but we're the most densely populated county in Florida with almost 3,500 people per square mile. Um, I have a feeling that that has to do with Miami-Dade's county. Um, they have a good portion of their county land is the Everglades. So obviously it's not populated, but based on numbers and size, uh, we are the most densely populated county in Florida. We have 280 square miles total and uh, 588 miles of coastline with 35 miles of beaches. There are 24 municipalities in our community, not including unincorporated Pinellas County. Out of those 24 municipalities, 22 of them participate in the community rating system. So just another little quick um, close up here. So as you can see here, this is our, this is our whole county. Um, and over here, this is our storm surge. Um, the red is areas that would be inundated by a category one hurricane. So it's quite a, quite a bit of land here. Um, and as I close in a little bit on this area, as you can see the red and it goes down to this purple, um, and this blue area is the county um, floodplain. So just because we have inundation of storm surge doesn't necessarily mean we haven't determined specific areas in our county that have um, possible flood hazards. So uh, many of you might be aware of this. We're just gonna kind of quickly go through the types of flood risks that we have here in Pinellas County. Um, we have riverine, surface localized, and we have coastal, which can be two things. Um, that's storm surge and a new, a new type of coastal, which is blue sky flooding. Um, so some of you are coastal communities, you might experience this. Others um, might not really experience it fully. So I'm just kind of gonna go through what blue sky flooding is. So blue sky flooding is, um, even when it doesn't rain, it's still flooding. Um, so for instance, we have this area, this is a, a coastal a residential area, as you can see, it's just super blue outside and it hasn't really rained, but we just have random flooding in the middle of the road here. So this is this area here and um, these, these colorings on the side is our sea level rise inundation. So as you can tell, we have um, some king tides and things like that that have been getting uh, more intense and more frequent in our area, causing some blue sky flooding on streets. So that's another one of the flood risks and flood hazards that we're kind of dealing with in our county, um, which is why it's pertinent for us to have a program for public information. So we can kind of share this information to our public and um, provide them with as much information as possible. So this next slide, um, I'm going to kind of hit on our local mitigation strategy. So uh, I'm I'm sure you guys have something like this for your counties and your communities. Um, so the local mitigation strategy is our multi-jurisdictional all hazards mitigation guide. It integrates mitigation initiatives established through policies, programs, and regulations. Um, it has to be in accordance with the Federal Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000, which allows for us to get grant funding from FEMA um, after a storm, things like that. It also serves as the counties, the unincorporated counties, and many municipalities in our County's um, floodplain management plan, which is your CRS 510, um, if you need that kind of reminder. This uh, picture in the background is from our storyboard that we created for the local mitigation strategy. Um, it's You can find it at this website down here. This is our LMS website you can go to um, if you'd like to in your future. Um, so as you can see here, this is another thing that was pulled from that storyboard about mitigation, but our local mitigation strategy is our 510 FMP. The program for public information, the multi-jurisdictional one that we have is an appendix of that local mitigation strategy. Um, so within that appendix of the program for public information, as well as also dealing with public information and outreach, we have the flood response plan, which is 330 FRP. And then we also have the flood insurance improvement plan, which is um, the sections for 370, which is your coverage improvement plan, implementation and flood insurance assessment. That's all wrapped up into this program for public information, which falls as an appendix of the local mitigation strategy. So that's kind of how we layer it here um, within our community. So with that, program for public information. I'm sure you guys are all aware you need to kind of create a working group to determine what that 
um, how that program is going to lay out. So our working group is a very long name. Uh, it's the Flood Risk and Mitigation Public Information Working Group. We call it FRIMPI because it's easier than saying that <laughs> mouthful of words. Um, so it's 16 municipalities um, plus unincorporated Pinellas County, so 17 municipalities total. We have quite a bit of people on there. So just as a quick reminder, there are 24 municipalities, not including Pinellas County Unincorporated here in our area. 22 of them participate in the community rating system and 16 of those 22 participate in our multi-jurisdictional PPI. So um, I have highlighted here the stakeholders. I just kind of wanted to hit on the types of stakeholders that we have in our in our friend free group. It includes our real estate professionals, insurance professionals, mortgage professionals. We also have elected officials. Um, we have people from the media that are there. And then we also have some individual residential um, like people, homeowners and um, homeowner associations that our municipalities have for their stakeholders. We meet three times per year. And within this group, we've identified 10 topics with specific key messages. So those 10 topics include the six from CRS, and then we've added four more that would be pertinent as well as the six from CRS, pertinent to our um, municipalities and in our area with our communities. Um, and we have key messages for those 10 topics. So I, I did really wanna hit, I don't have it written here on this slide, but I really wanna hit that this multi-jurisdictional PPI is very encompassing. Um, it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot, like as Lisa said, it's a lot of work, but it's really great for your municipalities. Um, so when it comes to multi-jurisdictional, the county isn't doing everything. We, we leave it up to the, to the municipalities, individual municipalities. They have to get their stakeholders. They have to complete their projects for them to get credit in CRS. That's on them. We have this and we determine what these are, but it's up to them to make the effort and do it within their community. So they have to find their stakeholders. What we do is we require two stakeholders and two um, municipal people to be involved in the group. So one of them, one from each, so one stakeholder and one municipal um, employee has to show up to every meeting. So we ask for two of each of those. So that way there's always a backup. Um, but the municipality is responsible for determining who their stakeholders are. And if one of their stakeholders drops off, they need to provide us with information for the new stakeholders so we can update our mailing list. So um, there's quite a different range. You can include you know, contractors and things like that. Um, one of the things you could probably also include is maybe some surveyors that your building department works close with. Um, we don't have that currently, but stakeholders can really be a, a broad spectrum. Just really look into what works for your community for that, but um, we meet three times a year with 10 topics. So um, with that program for public information, I'm gonna kind of hit on the outreach projects of those. So our outreach projects are pretty, pre pretty encompassing. We have quite a bit of projects that range from like our website updates, brochures. We have um, landscape trainings and mailers, email blasts, social media, speakers bureau. We've got so many projects and um, it kind of, it's very encompassing, but it pertains to what works with our community. Um, and those work with the messages and the topics that we've decided. So we've um, identified the 10 topics. We've identified the key messages for those topics. And then what happens is that from that, we determine tailored projects for the targeted audiences, um, which is part come, can be part of specific initiatives that we've identified as well, and then the services that relate to those initiatives. So for instance, um, the real estate disclosure program, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, is a targeted initiative for our real estate professionals. Um, that's a combination of many different services, including the flood map service, including a training, including a brochure. So it's quite a bit of projects all linked together to push out this real estate disclosure program, which is an initiative of this program for public information. So um, we have quite a bit of different things. Obviously, you can see on here the real estate professionals. We have uh, insurance professionals as well, mortgage professionals, our library cooperative, and um, municipal separate projects. So with that, um, as we're kind of talking about outreach projects, um, when we meet three times a year, our municipalities, if they're coming up with new projects that they think would work with our you know, our key messages and our key topics or within some of our initiatives, they bring it up in our meetings. Um, we discuss it if some of the other municipalities think that that's a project that they wanna do and we, we vote on it to see if we wanna add this project to the PPI and that's kind of how new projects get added. Um, so with that, 
the, the differences of projects that we have, um, I, I want to hit on this outreach project matrix, um, which I can bring up a little bit later um, and show you kind of drag you around. So pretty much what we've done is that we've identified all of the projects that we have within our PPI um, a description, and then it's all the municipalities. So what happens is that the municipalities get this once a year. They identify which projects they plan on completing in the year. This really helps our ISO officers. Um, we have two here in Pinellas County. So this really helps ISO kind of identify when they're going through and doing um, and doing their ratings of things and their points breakups. It helps them identify which municipalities are doing which projects so they know what to look for when they're rating those municipalities. As you can see here in the yellow, the yellow ones are countywide reach. They're done by the county and they reach countywide. So all of the municipalities will get credit for this yellow across the board. Um, and I do kind of want to highlight this section right here. Um, which I hope that you can see. So as you can tell, we have OP2 and OP3. Um, so OP3 is the flood guide. That's our flood information brochure. OP2 is also the flood guide. The reason why the bottom one at the county libraries is highlighted yellow is because we have a library cooperative. So that expands across the entire county um, and it's shared throughout. So that's something that's made available through the whole county. All, all of our municipalities get it. However, the flood guides that are available at county and city buildings, that's not a countywide reach. Each municipality is responsible for putting that flood guide identified and determined by this program um, in their county or city buildings for them to get credit for this portion of that project. So that's kind of how we break it down. Um, and it, it makes it easier for us and our municipalities to kind of keep up with what projects are available if they wanted to start new ones within their community. Um, as a reminder, the municipalities only get credit for the projects that they complete within their community. Um, so I kind of want to also highlight on some different initiatives, some major initiatives that we've had here in Pinellas County through that um, program for public information. So one of them was developing a um, Pinellas County flood map service. All of the municipalities have access to this. You can go onto the website and pull this up. It's open to the public. It has a bunch of different key cards, as you can see here, which relate to specific things. Um, when you click on a key card, what, what happens is it brings you to a landing page that describes the information that you're going to be seeing on the map application. And then you can click on the map application, open it up and search for properties. Um, so this is a really big push for us. It was really encompassing with our EGIS team but it's very helpful for our municipalities and our residents of getting out new information um, and current information for our flood risks. So you can access that uh, two ways if you kind of want to go into that. We have it set up this way. You can go direct to the, the link, which is floodmaps.pinellascounty.org, um, or you can go to our Pinellas County website, uh, pinellascounty.org forward slash flooding, and you can click on it here in the maps and zones or over here. Um, we have it two different ways. We, we push this out to everything. It's in all of our brochures. It's in all of our, um, you know, social media posts. It's, it's, we push it out consistently and we've kind of trained with having this. We've trained our residents and our real estate agents and our insurance agents and mortgage companies to really go to this map application and view what they're looking for. So another initiative that we have that I, I hit on a little bit is the real estate flood disclosure program. Um, that includes three different things. It's the map service, which I just talked about, the brochure that we've created for them and a training. So we do a training with them twice a year, um, which is here. For the past couple of years, we've been doing it virtually because of COVID. Um, we're kind of gonna start possibly moving into a more hybrid or um, back into fully in-person in the near future. So here's our flood map service. Um, here's a little picture of the brochure that we have, which is I know your flood risk before you buy or build in Pinellas County. Um, and then here's kind of like when you get close in on that map, a little bit of what it looks like. So I want to kind of hit on the brochure. So with this um, and as the flood map application, we didn't just say, here's our flood map application, choose one of these tiles and hopefully this happens. What we did is we went a little bit further. We developed a specific tile for our real estate agents. So when you go on, it's this um, landing page here, it provides information about real estate agents and what they need to do with Pinellas County. Um, further down on this landing page, it has a, um, a link here, which I'll talk about in a second. So what happens is when you click on this map, you can type in any address, uh, it'll bring you to the address and then you click on the parcel. And what happens is that um, this 
brochure will be developed. Uh, we have this brochure as the front, this the back. Um, and this is slightly, this looks slightly different now because we just recently made changes to reflect some of our new key messages. Um, but on the back here, we have this part. So what happens is that when they click on that parcel, this part automatically gets filled out for them based upon um, the flood zones in that area from SFHA and those things. This gets filled out and then they can download this and immediately send it to their clients. So the cool thing about this is that um, they can access it anywhere through their phone, tablet, laptop, like while they're on the go. A lot of times, uh, one of the things that our real estate professionals stated is that um, this is really great when you're in the office, but I have a lot of clients that say, hey, I found this thing on Zillow. Can we go check it out while we're out in the field? And it wasn't one that they really had any information on. But what works is that while they're, while they're out at that house, they can type in the address on this map, pull it up on their phone, and it'll show them what that flood hazard is here. So they kind of already know. And then it provides them information on, you know, what a flood hazard is, understanding flood insurance, what the building regulations are, um, finding out your flood risk, evacuation zones, all of that here for them. Uh, ooh, too far. So as you can see, that's down here. It's this little application right here. You click on this and it pulls it up. So it was really, um, it's a fully encompassing. It involves multiple different smaller projects that all link into one giant initiative. Um, so the next thing that I wanna talk about is initiative. We, we just recently started this last year. It's our social media initiative. So as we were going through this, our, our Frimpy group kind of noticed um, that we do a really great job on social media pushing out messages when there's when there is a rainy event and when there is um, you know a hurricane or a tropical storm coming through but we don't do a really great job at pushing out any other messages um, for the rest of our 10 topics so we kind of started this uh, blue sky social media initiative last year um, and as you can see here are our 10 topics um, and then we've identified which topics we're going to do during specific time periods. So it's not just randomly throughout the year. And we've scheduled um, individual messages. So they're pretty, they're pretty encompassing. As you can see, this one's like for Valentine's Day. They're kind of cutesy, um, but they really kind of relate back to what our topics are. We've also used this hashtag Floodplain Friday. So all of the messages get posted to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All of them get posted to those three social media things on Fridays with the hashtag Floodplain Friday um, to kind of get used to that. Majority of them, actually almost all of them, have a bit.ly where you can click on the bit.ly, um, go to a web page, and pull up any information that you would need for that. So here's an example. This one is from Twitter um, for the rainy season here in Pinellas. It's 30 days after purchase for your flood insurance. Um, as you can see here, this one was just recently um, for the day after St. Patrick's Day. And this one has a lot to do with our um, protecting natural functions, that type of thing here. So we kind of just, we like to relate it to what's coming up and making it, you know, cutesy, but also providing quality information um, for our residents. So it has a specific, like it's, it's pretty broad in, in CRS, uh, social media messages, they're considered like a general outreach, but um, it, it works really well for us and, and it's allowed us to reach certain audiences um, with that particular thing. So those are a few of our initiatives that we have. We have quite a few more, but I kind of want to show you how we break it down in CRS um, for our 330 points breakdown. So on the CRS resources webpage, they give you kind of um, an Excel spreadsheet that you can fill out. And it looks very similar to this. We've we've kind of upgraded it. So that way it's easier for us to identify. So as you can see this OP numbers on this side with the outreach projects, I um, kind of identify with that OP matrix that I showed earlier. Um, we identify if it has a stakeholder, targeted audience. And then here is the documentation link. So when we send this to ISO and our municipalities go through and fill this out and they send it to their ISO specialists, um, if for some reason they, they didn't get to see what we were looking for or what they needed, we can easily click here and it'll take us exactly where we need to go on our S drive or wherever, wherever it's located. Um, so that way we can easily pull it up. So this kind of helps us in the back end. Um, but it's very easy to see as we go through, we do the points per topics, we identify which topics are covered times per year, um, if it was an FIA project. Um, so within that FIA, which is the flood insurance assessment, which is 370 encompassed into this PPI program that we have, we've identified specific projects that relate to that 
coverage improvement plan. Um, so we identify if these ones are part of that coverage improvement plan or not, what the count is, the points, and then we identify if it was a PPI project or not. Um, so this helps with our municipalities because some projects that they do are not in the PPI yet. Um, and some of them are, so this kind of helps break down those points. And at the bottom, it adds it all up. Um, so we, we know what kind of points we're expecting to get. Um, and we provide this you know, to our ISO officers and things like that so they can provide us back with their changes. I'm gonna do a little bit of close up because it's a little hard to see. This is of that, that side area here. So as you can see, um, the OP and the outreach project, what the description is, jurisdiction, stakeholder, target audience, and then the documentation. So that's what uh, this is, how, how we kind of break it down. We do the same thing for a flood response plan, which is what I'm kind of going to get into. So with this program for public information, it's not just OP outreach projects. We also talk about flood response plan. So with that, we've kind of um, worked with our emergency management um, group to develop this super encompassing Excel spreadsheet. So this started in emergency management with our, our outreach person, emergency management, his name is Spencer. Started with him, he kind of went through and did this, and then it's been tweaked throughout with our, our Frimpy group working through it. Um, so we have the type of hazard here, if it's a minor, moderate, or high. And then as you can see here, it's like what type of media you'll be using for that. So we have all different kinds of alert panelists, so flash, reports, intelligent reports, uh, intelligent transportation systems, and then who's responsible for putting those things out. So uh, at the bottom, I don't have a more close in one, but we can kind of look at it as well later on when we do our open discussion, if you guys have questions. Um, so with that, it identifies if it's a minor expected roadway and yard flooding, here's the message that it's gonna be for this hazard. Um, if it's moderate, here's the message for this hazard. Uh, hi, here's the messages that we do for this hazard. And it kind of goes through it um, we've been updating it as we go. Every time we get a new, um, a new storm that comes through and we find that we're missing something or we need improvements on something, it, it's a consistently changing dynamic documents um, just so that way we make sure that we're meeting the needs during those flood response plans and those flood response actions. Um, and that kind of falls within our after action like review of what happens. Okay, we really need to upgrade this and this. Uh, one of the things that we've identified in our PPI annual report for this year is that next year um, we plan on revamping this completely and kind of either revamping it so it's easier to search for specific messages within this Excel spreadsheet or migrating this Excel spreadsheet onto a SharePoint um, where it would be a lot easier to kind of search for what you're looking for, um, whether it's the hazard, what type of minor, moderate, or high. And then like, if you're looking for a specific message, say for instance, for rain gauges, you need a specific message for above normal tides, minor roadway and rain gauge messages, something similar to that kind of searching capability. So obviously it's not perfect, but we're going through and we're, we're identifying that the problems with it and we're making changes as a group to kind of figure out what's gonna work. So these are two examples um, of what we've done in the past, this one was during Irma, which was a news release. And then this one was during Elsa, which these messages are identified on this uh, Excel spreadsheet. So the other thing is our flood insurance improvement plan. I know I've talked about it a little bit. Um, just wanna make sure, check my time. Okay, I know I talked about it a little bit, uh, but this is just how we have this. Uh, Pinellas County um, requests the flood insurance information for the entire county, all municipalities. And then we go through and we make changes to this improvement plan. And then we send that out to the Frimpy group. They identify whatever they think needs changes or provide information. And then it comes back as like a review process and then it gets approved. So this is a table that we've had um, on, on our flood insurance improvement plan. These are all of the municipalities. Um, and then like how many policies they have, how many losses they've had, uh, the premiums that are enforced, insurance that's enforced, those types of things. Here's our table of contents, just kind of a quick thing. I can pull that up and, and go through it a little bit more in depth if you would like um, later on. So the other thing that kind of ties all of this together is that we have this all-encompassing multi-jurisdictional program um, but how do we really help share this information with our multiple municipalities? I'm sure you guys are aware that um, practically every municipality, whether you're a county or a city or um, whatever it may be, any type of government entity, you have a, a lot of firewalls that you kind of have blocks about sharing a certain amount of uh, things or 
providing specific things and it's always a struggle. Um, so what we did is we created this SharePoint toolkit. Uh, it did get revamped to kind of um, look more modern with how SharePoint wants them to do. So this is the front page. We provide uh, our municipalities. The stakeholders um, can have read access to this if they would choose. Um, and uh, all of the municipalities, uh, at least one of their one of their participants have access to this. Um, so they can go in. This is what it looks like at the home page. If you scroll down on the home page, it looks like this. Um, but we have it identified. I'm going to go back once so you kind of see this. So we have it identified. Here's where you can upload your project documentation. Um, here's some projects and instructions for our OP projects uh, and our FRP projects. And then here on the left side, we have you know, our LMS and PPI plans. So those would be like the annual reports, um, the full set of plans that people can download, any implemented files. These implemented files are the upload projects. Um, we have a discussion board, so people have questions. And then these two are fairly new because uh, 610 documentation, that would be like the after action reports for ELSA and ADA, that's here. And then we have the, the new thing. So I'm sure you guys are aware, the CCMP, which is the, um, the construction certificates management plan that's now part of the CRS. So we, as the county, did an all-encompassing one. We put it here so the municipalities that participate in Frimpy can kind of pull that off and use it as a um, as a template for theirs. Um, we have a train. We did a training on it. I recorded the training so they can click here at any time. We have reminders and events. So any of our municipalities can go on if they're doing an event, whether it's a public event, a training, a whatever it may be they can go on here and put the reminders and events this can link to their calendar so they can get updates for it um, and then any kind of announcements as well so um it we we seem to have a little bit of time i can do a quick drive through of this the next one is just the op projects um instructions and plans but it's a little hard to get if if you're not really fully driving through it so um since we do have a little bit of time for that i'm gonna go ahead and close out of this and pull it up here. Um, so it looks like this when you come into this. Let me make sure this is fully zoomed. There we go. When you come into this, um, it looks pretty much the same. You can kind of flip through the events. Um, all of the ones that are here with this orange tile are like, they're identified as holidays. Um, but it's just whatever the, this one, for instance, is a severe weather awareness week. So any kind of like, week or day or things like that, I put that in here. So our municipalities, they feel like doing something during those time periods on social media that kind of falls in that social media initiative. Um, so I'm going to click here on the OP projects and instructions. Um, obviously, you can see the upcoming awareness weeks here. Um, and then it provides you with some basic information about how it's part of the CRS activities. Um, project titles are listed below with descriptions. So I'm gonna scroll down here so you can see. So here are all of our identified projects. Um, as you go through, I'm gonna click on like the flood guide, for instance. You have the flood guide. If you go over here, you can click on these projects and instructions. It brings you to a separate page. It gives you some information about it and then it gives the design files. So the, the county and our marketing communications team developed this flood guide, our flood brochure. Um, and then it was went through and was uh, approved and reviewed by the PPI, um, the Frimpy group. And then what happens is that we put it on here. So any of our municipalities can download the design files or they can just download the current ones. And if they download the design files, they can send that to their marketing communications team and add their own municipality information. However, on the back of the brochure, we do have a section in there that um, if you fall within a specific municipality, please visit this website to go to those municipality information. So we always have that on the back, um, but if they wanna make it more specific and tailored to them, they have that ability to with these design files. Um, so I'm gonna go back one here. So that's how the outreach projects are. And then with that, we've kind of identified um, where people can go in and upload their project documentation. So this really helps our municipalities um, as they're going throughout the year, when, when they're doing projects, I'm sure you guys are probably aware, um, but when you're going through and you're doing projects throughout the year and now it comes down to, okay, I need to figure out which projects I did and I didn't really fully keep track because the time got away from me and you kind of have to filter back through all the things that you've done in the year. Um, we've kind of done this upload project documentation. So where as soon as you do the project, you can upload it to here. So you no longer have to kind of filter through what, what you did in the past. You can kind of just come here, search for your municipality, 
filter by and choose a municipality. You can do countywide. We always suggest countywide for, um, for our municipalities and then whoever their municipality is. So I'm going to click here on St. Pete um, and I'm pushing apply. It'll sort by all the ones for St. Petersburg and countywide. It'll tell you what the project name is. Um, if it has a title, how many times it was implemented. So like, for instance, our real estate brochures, you need to have at least five examples from different um, from different real estate agents or real estate professionals. So how, if this is the first the first brochure that you received, second one, et cetera, when it was implemented, um, the actual PDF that you can download and kind of go through that. So it's really awesome. It's super easy to implement the files. You just click on new. It brings you, walks you through the form. You upload what you're needing and it's there. Um, so this is really great. This is also something we've kind of wanted our ISO officers to be able to, to go on here, filter through what their municipality it is that they're looking at um, and be able to download all of the documents at one time. So you can click on all of the documents and then you can push download or you can click on one, whichever one you need and download. You can click download all of them at once, however you want to do it. Um, but it's really great. This is something that we're still working with our ISO officers about going through this, but they do have access to this um, for them to be able to, to look at this. They're just not quite there yet. So that's something that we're kind of working towards. So this is kind of how, how we provide all the information to our municipalities um, with templates and things like that and how they can track their documentation for the PPI program and the LMS. Um, so that's, that's pretty much our whole program. Are there any questions? I see we have like a lot of chats, so I'm gonna pull those up here. Thank you, Maxine, that was great. Um, I just wanna circle back and, and say, you know, ISO has access to this, but we have a brand new um, specialist, CRS specialist. So we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. And I know that um, ISO sent us a link. So we'll be adding all our files for our CRS verification visit to the, obviously to the link that ISO sent us. But when we go through our verification visit, this is gonna be a really useful tool to pull up to show documentation. Um, and I jotted down a couple of things here. So uh, one of the advantages of having a multi-jurisdictional over just the unincorporated one, which we started out with, like I said, we started with like a half a dozen people, a couple of real estate agents and um, some staff and some residents. And, you know, it, it just kind of grew because all the municipalities wanted in on it. And it, one of the advantages is you've got that consistent messaging across the county. And with the calendar that we have on the SharePoint, that consistent messaging can go out at similar times during the year. So it's really advantageous um, to have it set up this way to the residents because they're getting that messaging from us then say from one of the cities and it's all in that same timeline. So it's reiterating that information. Um, the other uh, advantage of course of the program is the other activities in CRS. Uh, so for example, the activity three, what is it? 340 for the mm -hmm. um, property protection. So we'll have a project for property protection outreach, and then you get those bonus points or for 540 for your stream dumping regulations. Um, our fleet, we have a lot of vehicles wrapped with only rain down the drain. So that would be a project that Yes, it's an outreach project, general messaging to the to the public at a point, but it's also getting you the additional credit through the actual activity for only rain down the drain, right? No dumping regulations. So it, it ties into multiple other activities as well. So it's really worthwhile having. Um, and let's see what else. Oh, and we tied this together. This really is the outreach arm for the floodplain management plan. And that's why we put it into the LMS because one of the mitigation strategies for flooding is to do outreach. So the PPI really serves as the outreach arm of that mitigation strategy. Um, for floodplain, specifically for the flooding. Um, obviously, local mitigation strategy covers all the hazards. So for the flood hazard, the PPI serves as the outreach arm. And it's, let's see, I had one more note on here. So all of this just kind of ties together and make sure that you have a comprehensive floodplain management plan. You're working across departments and you're working across jurisdictions so that you're getting that, that consistent messaging out. And I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Do you want to have a conversation or... You want to write questions in the chat? I know it was yeah, a lot of information. It. Thank yeah, thank you, Lisa, so much. That was a very awesome presentation. Um, I see that you linked those links that uh, Maxine was pointing out throughout the presentation. So thank you for doing that. We'll make sure that'll go out to everyone in the room as well. Can you all share the slides with me as well? So when we do follow-ups with everyone, we can provide those as well. Of course, sure. definitely. 
Great. And then I see Emily said having the documentation links and the OP worksheet is fantastic. Thanks for that, Emily. And then I know we have at least one question in the room. So let me switch over the microphone to our room mic. And then let's do this. Oh, no. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. That was really interesting. Um, I'm working with the locality here on a PPI. And it's their first. They're just getting started. So it's amazing to see how much you guys have accomplished and um, and just the breadth of what, what you're doing. I um, have a question, I have two questions. Um, one is about the pro project documentation database and how it's populated. Um, specifically, you know, when you went in, uh, you talked about the map service and how real estate agents can pull up and produce a brochure that they can share with their clients. Does that um, automatically somehow populate the database or is there a separate step where you have to um, physically enter, you know, the number of times in the database? So the real estate agents that download those, if they are participating in the program, they'll send them to us. We actually have an upload um, application on the website. So they just go and they can click, they can upload 10 at a time. So once they process them, sometimes they'll use them as an open house. Sometimes they'll just give them, email them out to clients that they're showing houses to. But when they're done doing that, they'll send a copy of it to us and then we'll file it on the SharePoint site. So no, it's not getting automatically populated, but we do have the um, tracking of how many hits are, are on that map application. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And so then, what do you, um, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> when you come to this, I just wanted to do a quick thing. So when you come to this page, it gives you the, the brochure here, just like a blank brochure. But if you scroll down, we have this upload copies right here. They can also find this on the website. But when you go to this upload copies, it brings you this form. They fill out their information, identify which jurisdictions they showed properties in, and then they can go down and upload up to 10 brochures. This gets submitted. It gets sent as an email to um, myself and Lisa and our um, contractor that kind of helps us manage this program as well. And then either me or our contractor, CC, will go in and individually upload these to this file a program. Okay, great, thank you. And mm -hmm. I had a, another question, um, and, and I think you probably had it on the screen, but I can't see it. Um, what were your additional four topics that you um, that you're covering? Yeah, I can kind of zoom oh. in on that. Um, so here, let me know if you can see that. Can you see that these topics here? I would go a little bigger, yes. Maxine. A little bigger. Okay, here we go. So we have um, the first six are the six from CRS. So know your flood hazard, ensure your property for your flood hazard, protect people from the flood hazard, protect your property from the flood hazard, build responsibly and protect natural floodplain functions. We also have a hurricane preparedness, pet preparedness, flood economics, and resiliency and sustainability. So the resiliency and sustainability one is new this past year. Um, we used to have a, a different one um, that had to do with insurance. So what we did as a group is that we just combined both, all of the insurance ones into the insure your property. Um, and we developed this resiliency and sustainability one. So that's a big push across our county for resiliency and sustainability. It's also a big push across our state of Florida. Um, so this kind of helps bring in other things that are happening within our state and within our municipalities and in our communities. Um, and it also helps bring in some other departments that we have to get their messaging across as well. So we have the, these are our 10 topics, the four additional ones, it's hurricane preparedness, pet preparedness, flood economics, and resiliency and sustainability. And I'll, be, I'll add to that too, that each one of those CRS changed how they're scoring this. So they're going with key messages now. So each one of these topics has a key message so that ISO can score it according to the new scoring criteria. Um, but as you're aware, different audiences might have to have a different key message or it might be more appropriate for a different audience, depending on who the audience is, what that key message is. So we have so many projects we're going to, we're well beyond the needing the points there. So um, we have more than one key message uh, per topic, perhaps depending on what the audience is, but our PPI calls out, this is the key message for this topic. This is the key message for that topic. Um, the resiliency one is something to the effect of consider building uh, stronger to withstand future storms, right? Taking into account the, you know, the climate change, the sea level rise and things like that. So we're yeah. just, that's a new one. So we're just kind of rolling that one in. And of course, pet preparedness uh, is we've sort of combined things like make sure that 
you, your family and your pets have all of their medication, you know, something to that effect. So we just, we try to kind of bundle things up where we can to get as much information out, you know, the most bang for your buck with a message to, to relay the information, because if you write a novel, nobody's going to read it. So it has to be pretty concise to get the information out. But the way that it's scored under CRS, you, you almost have to have that. that oh, no. <laughs> Lisa, we lost you. Um, yeah, you almost have to have like the ability to, I'm, I'm going to try to finish your sentence. Um, <laughs> you almost have to have the ability to kind of like combine what you're looking for and that how she kind of hit on like making your messages super concise and targeted. That has a lot to do with our marketing communications team. Um, we don't just develop these messages. As you know, like we're very technical um, and, and what we do can be very technical. And a lot of times we have very specific wording and specific um, things that need to get out that can be confusing for the public. So we're always consistently um, like going through. Okay, I wanted to make sure you, you guys can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay, hear you. okay, was, perfect. There was a thing in the chat, so I wanted to make sure you guys can hear me. Um, so we, we always are consistently working with our marketing communication. So the way that it works here in Pinellas County, um, so we, we reside at the Public Works Department, Lisa and I do. Um, so we have a, a public information officer for public works, we have two of them. So what happens is that when we have messaging, we send it to them, we get their changes coming back and forth, and then it goes to our supervisor for approval. But before it goes to our supervisors for approval to be sent out, we send it to the actual marketing communications department. We have a specific person in that department that helps us with our floodplain management messaging and projects. Um, she takes a review at it. They kind of work together with our marketing, uh, with our public works PIO and her to, to make it more friendly for the media than it does um, for us as technical people. So that that has a lot to do with the messages that we're getting put out. They're also really helpful in going through and updating our our brochures. So I mean, our brochures look really wordy, um, but they do a really great job at designing it in a way that um, is inviting and looks nice to look at, uh, but also is easier to read for most people because um, it it's a little bit difficult when you're trying to explain your technical terms and what you're needing them to do and what you're wanting them to do in layman's terms for a general public population or whatever that targeted population might be. So they're really helpful in that. I would suggest if you're not, if you don't have a really great relationship with your marketing communications department, definitely build one. It's super helpful with your PPI. It's really good to have them on your PPI because um, they can kind of identify as you're developing these projects for specific targeted audiences, they can kind of help you determine what projects work best for that. They know that that's what their subject matter expert is. We're, we're subject matter experts on floodplain management or building codes or emergency management, whatever you're, you're an expert on, but, but they, that's what they do. That's what they went to school for. That's what they do. So really just lean on them to help you get your messages out. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just curious what your structure is. Like, do you guys, it seems like the county is doing the bulk of a lot of the stuff. And then do the localities do completely their own stuff? Do they use your stuff? Do they, you all, do they all pay into like a, a budget to help contribute to the work that you guys are doing? And I, I was just trying to figure out how all that works so together. Okay, I understand that. That's a that's a really good question. So the county does a good majority of the bulk of things. Um, we're the ones that kind of push through and kind of figure out which projects we need. So the county um, is obviously expands across the whole county. We have a specific areas that that we know would need targeted messages. Um, and a lot of times, the county is the first one that that gets the the kind of like, hey, we we're probably missing something here. We need to figure out something. Um, and then our municipalities. A lot of times our municipalities don't have a big staff. So public works um, 
is very he big here in Pinellas County, but um, we have a, a little bit more staff to kind of help us with our departments on getting specific um, messages and targeted projects available. So what happens is that we have a consistent communication with our municipalities that participate. And even with the ones that don't participate, they'll call us and say, hey, like we're having this situation and I'm not really sure how we're supposed to go about it what would you suggest? And we work with them to kind of figure that out. But you are correct, the, the county does a good bulk of it. Um, and with the, the good bulk of it or projects that, that we think would be great, um, we bring to the group, we send it out to the group, we put it on the SharePoint, and then they can use those particular things as templates um, to kind of target or like um, kind of target towards what their municipality needs are. So they can use it as a template to target towards that. Um, I do also wanna say there are quite a bit of projects we have identified here in the, in the PPI that the county doesn't do. For instance, um, one of our, a few of our municipalities, probably about five or six of them do a high watermark signs um, in specific areas within their municipality. And that's a, a project that we have. The county doesn't do that. We don't, we don't have that. Um, but the municipalities do, and that's something that, that they've developed. And with that, because the county doesn't do that, we don't have any kind of templates with that. What we do is that we've asked those municipalities that do have those in place, can you provide us with pictures or design files or whatever you have? We can put it on that OP project's instructions so other municipalities, if they want to go through and do that, they can. Um, so our municipalities are they range from, from very large, like Clearwater and St. Petersburg, to small. We have one municipality that's only a mile. It's like a mile long. It's not any bigger. It's all residential properties. It's only a mile long. So it's very small, very tight-knit. Um, so it's a lot easier for them to get specific messages out with specific projects than it would be for some of our larger municipalities. So when it comes to that, some of those smaller, especially the beach municipalities, they have more specific projects that work for their area um, that are within our PPI that the county doesn't do. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, regarding the budget portion, no, our municipalities do not pay in for the budget portion of this. Uh, the county kind of takes that. Um, the way the budgeting works for the county, if, if Lisa was on, she'd explain it a little bit better, but um, and the way that it works in, in pretty much layman's terms is that we have a budget for unincorporated Pinellas County, and then we have a budget that goes to like all of Pinellas County. Um, so it depends when we're kind of determining which budget goes where and how that budget works. Some of the budget, if it's only unincorporated related things, it comes from this. And if it's across the whole county, then it comes from this. Are there any other questions? Any questions online for our online folks? I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see any hands raised. So if I'm missing something, please let me know. Okay. So if, um, I will provide the presentation to um, to you guys. So that way it can get sent out. If you, if any of you who are on here, um, let me throw up my email and Lisa's email um, really quick. So that way you can see it. It's here. Um, if any of you guys have questions or any other things that come up later on, send us an email. If you want to have a read only permissions to our SharePoint, so you can kind of navigate and see what that looks like. Um, let us know. We can give you read only access. If you want to see some of our other templates or how we do things, uh, by all means, we're, we're really good with sharing, um, you know, with, with not just within our municipality, but with our um, further counties. And I just want to add like one small thing because we're, we're super all encompassing. Um, we've actually, with the projects that we've established, we've actually been able to go outside to like, for instance, Sarasota County. So during Florida Flood Awareness Week, Sarasota County has this program that they've already have initiated. Um, it's with Floody, Floody the Frog. Um, and they go through and they have this massive program, um, but we've partnered with them for Florida Flood Awareness Week. And we, we've kind of worked with them and we use Floody the Frog on our social media messages. I mean, it's only on social media that we do Florida Flood Awareness Week. But um, I mean, every little bit of getting information out helps and it, it's really helpful to kind of have that communication and that line with them. So yes, we're all encompassing within our county, but we've worked outside of our counties with other counties to kind of make that messaging across the board, not just in our county, but just across our states, all sort of the same messaging to get out. Um, so that's a, also a plus to work with your other municipalities around you. Okay.
since there are no more questions, thank you guys so much for having Lisa and I here. Um, and, you know, as always, you guys can send us an email um, and we can help you in any ways that you see fit. Thank you all so much for your presentation today, Maxine. It was very, very thorough, very helpful. Thank you all so much. We're very glad for having here, having us here. So thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, just let us know. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye now. Bye. Okay. Great. So let me reshare our presentation wherever that went. Oh, okay. That's not what I wanted to happen. Great. Okay. Let's see. Okay. And then we have a poll for our folks online. So I'm going to end the last one. Just a quick reminder. I've had it up for 52 minutes. So if you have not answered the last poll, this is your last chance on that one. But thank you all for answering that. I'm going to launch the next one. Question is, are you interested in participating in a regional program for public information or PPI? If the folks in the room want to answer this question too, that would be great if you all, if we want to have a discussion about what that would look like. So we have on here, yes, no, not applicable. I work for a locality where we already have a PPI and I'm not interested in joining another, not applicable. I don't work for a locality, but I'd like to participate in a regional outreach effort or not applicable. I don't work for a locality and I'm not interested in participating. And if there's any um, anyone online too that wants to add to the discussion, please feel free. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that poll up, but for those of y'all who are CFMs, please make sure that you fill that out. Is there any comments in the room about starting a PPI? Great. <laughs> so yeah, that, I mean, their program looked really extensive. Um, oh, Tristan, Norfolk has a PPI, but I think a regional one would be great. Yeah, regional one. I just want to say we have oh one moment let me switch the microphone over so everyone can okay this is Danielle Sweet at the city of Virginia Beach um not speaking on behalf of Virginia Beach but just to make people aware that there is a public information um work group through the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission that has representatives um for PIOs from all 17 localities within the HRPDC so you know there is a, a pocket or a group to target um if we wanted to generate you know an idea with them or just to put it out there that that could potentially be a future resource um, for those subject matter experts for messaging down the road if this is something we're interested in doing. Yeah, that'd be great. I think that SharePoint resource is really interesting and something that I think it's worth trying to explore and set up and see um, just what it looks like on the back end, even just to have that discussion. I really was interested in what that, that I should have asked them what the discussion tab looks like um and Kate, like even if we don't set up something permanently just having that discussion board across members might be really helpful. great okay i'm going to go ahead and move on to the next unless anyone online has anything to add okay switch the mic back over um virginia flood this is back to a little bit of our administrative stuff because we wanted to make sure the folks in florida had enough time for their presentation this morning um, just a quick plug for the Virginia Floodplain Management Association or the VFMA. Um, individual memberships are $25. Corporate memberships are $150. Um, oh, I see that Matt also just threw in the chat. Norfolk is happy to share our PPI lessons learned with the PDC. Oh, yeah, that would be great. We can, I'll talk about that with you offline, Matt. That's great. Um, ISO representative, she's here in the meeting, or at least she was at the beginning. I, I think she might still be here. Um, Emily Schmidt is here with us. So if any, oh, I see you, Emily. Do you have any general updates for us today or anything that we need to know? Um, 
the the only thing that's kind of uh, odd about this year is that based on everybody's five or three year rolling recertification timeline, no communities are scheduled to have a cycle visit with me this year. Um, that's not to say that if somebody wants to do a modification, that could definitely happen this year. Um, we, I'm still on the lookout for folks that have um, are getting their calves underway to do new applications. Um, and, and so I'm open to any of those kind of discussions. I just don't have anybody on my calendar for cycle visits this year. Um, I still have a couple from last year that I'm working on closing out. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still here for, for questions. I, I work on all of the communities in Virginia and in the state of Georgia. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. cool. So on to our next little bit of an update. So FEMA had an RFI that we talked about during our last meeting, the request for information on updates, the national flood insurance. Um, programs, minimum standards. Wetlands Watch did submit a letter in response to those, in response to that RFI, RFI on those NFIP minimum standards. Our comments mainly focused on um, increasing capacity for local government staff to enforce the NFIP minimum standards, creating sea level rise risk zones specifically for coastal communities to adhere to their more specific flood risk and then expanding the special flood hazard areas to include not only just the 100 year flood zones, but the 100 and 500 year flood zones. Um, you all can read our full letter on our Wetlands Watch website. And then it's also hyperlinked in this presentation. So when we send it around um, later this week, you all be able to open it and read it. But we just wanted to let you all know that we did submit comments on that. The Virginia Community Flood Preparedness Fund. So the first auction of 2020 happened back on March 9th. The state of Virginia um, got $74 million from this past auction. 45% uh, of that, as a reminder, goes into the Community Flood Preparedness Fund. So around $33 million went into the latest round. So in terms of all the auctions that Virginia has participated in so far, there's nearly $136 million currently in the Community Flood Preparedness Fund, but that is not subtracting from the grants that already went out in round one and round two. So that's just total. Um, just as a reminder, first round, $7.8 million went out. Second round, $24.5 million went out. Um, just as a reminder, we've been talking about a lot, at least in our newsletters, the third round for the Community Flood Preparedness Fund is currently open. This is the largest grant round that they've had thus far. $40 million is available. Applications are due next Friday, April 8th, um, by 4 p.m., very particular time. And then we, and we were told back in November, November of 2021, that those awards should be announced on June 17th but a lot has been moving around with the Community Flood Preparedness Fund. So we're not quite sure if that is still the date where those will be announced, but the last that we heard that is when they should be announced. Um, we have a lot of resources on the Wetlands Watch website. If you all are interested in um, applying for a grant through the Community Flood Preparedness Fund, our newest resource that we created was a local resilience plan application outline. If folks are interested, I can run through what that looks like, but basically what it is is a streamlined um, document that helps communities who are looking to apply for a local resilience plan. And as a reminder, you have to have a local resilience plan that has been approved by DCR to apply to project grant funding within the Community Flood Preparedness Fund. Um, and basically what that is, that application outline document that we created with, alongside the Environmental Defense Fund, it's just four pages and it's kind of like a checklist of here are all the things that your um, local resilience plan needs to include. So as opposed to going through the 50 page grant manual that DCR has out and trying to figure out what all you need to include, this is more of a streamlined document. Um, so you're not kind of guessing and checking throughout the larger grant manual document. We also have just a general Community Flood Preparedness Fund tracking website that includes all the previously approved um, local resilience plans if anyone's interested in looking at what examples of that looks like. We also have a three page fact sheet on the Community Flood Preparedness Fund. We have a list of consultants who have worked, are currently working with or have previously worked with localities to create their local resilience flood plans. So if you all are interested in hiring a consultant to do that, um, we have a list of ones that I've worked with folks in the past. And then we also, um, 
BCN, the Virginia Conservation Network, has also has a interactive map of all the approved applications on their website. That's pretty cool to look at. So all, once again, all these things are hyperlinked in our presentation. You all can check them out um, once the slides go around. Any questions on the Community Flood Preparedness Fund? Any folks online have questions? Great. Um, just a quick legislative update. Um, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is the um, auction that I was just talking about before, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, is what the money from for CFPF comes from. So there was a cost-benefit analysis report that was mandated by Governor Yunkin to come out. That report came out last week. It's hyperlinked here in case you all are interested in looking at it. Um, we have a couple bills that uh, will affect CFPF if the governor does decide to sign these into law. So we have um, the flood resilience master planning bills. Essentially what's that, what that is going to do is the current coastal resilience master plan that went out this past December, I believe, um, will be, uh, the initiative is to create a statewide plan and for that to have to come out by 2026. It also mandates that there's a technical advisory committee that helps steer the creation of that statewide master plan. Um, there's also a bill to migrate the entity that oversights the Community Flood Preparedness Fund from DCR, which is where it currently is, to the Soil and Water Conservation Board, and it also adds two seats to the Soil and Water Conservation Board. I believe there's currently nine seats. It would bump it up to 11. One of those seats would be to focus, is supposed to focus on the coastal community aspect of resilience planning, and then the other one is supposed to be appointed to focus on inland flooding for resilience. Um, and then there's also another bill that creates the Resilient Virginia Revolving Loan Fund. So it's supposed to create a loan program that localities and I believe also individuals to apply to, to get um, resilience funding. Um, so it's a separate entity from the Community Flood Preparedness Fund. Last I heard, they were trying to get around $25 million put into that fund initially. Um, but once again, it has yet to be approved. It, these are all waiting Governor Yunkin's um, signature and his action deadline on these are April 11th. So stay tuned on that. And then the special session for the budget starts next Monday, I believe, April 4th. If April 4th is Monday, that's when it starts because the budget has was not approved during regular session for those who do not know. CFPF poll. I believe I'm just asking y'all who is interested. So I'm closing the PPI poll. One last 10, five second chance to answer this if you're a CFM. Gonna end that one. CFPF round three, launching this poll. Are you planning on applying for community flood preparedness fund round three funding? If you want, please elaborate in the chat on what type of funding you're pursuing. So folks in the room, is anyone or any locality is pursuing a community flood preparedness fund grant this round? It's $40 million, it's a lot of money. Does anyone need help applying? I see some folks have said yes online. If if you all, if you want to come off mute or if you want to throw in the chat um, what you're planning on applying for, that would be great. Matt Dallin, I see that you threw in another bill in there. Do you want to elaborate on that? Just a correction. It's not the uh, house bills 516, not 16. Oh. Okay, thank you. William, we would like help understanding and applying town of Colonial Beach. Great, yeah, no, I can reach out afterwards. Here, I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat. Ryan, we have a program study for citywide inlet capacity and pipe upgrade project. Oh, great.
Does anyone want to share in the room why you're not applying, if you don't mind? Is it, is it a capacity problem? You already, you already have enough money. You don't want any of the $40 million or anybody online who said no as well. And we will be applying. Um, we have to work within the political climate that we're given. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe uh, Kathy can uh, answer better, but the thing is the, the we get the around $5 million for the second round, and uh, yes. all the money go to like a big comprehensive um, program that we don't uh, look into. Mm -hmm. So um, we cannot identify which is have not been um, uh, eligible for ground free kind of thing. We still kind of the process of uh, using the $5 million to see the fund for the second round. Gotcha. And I guess that's for me, just maybe you need to learn a little bit more about it, the criteria, and, and then look at it from that perspective and then I can make a good decision on yeah, I'm absolutely. In a position to do that, so that will be helpful. Yeah, definitely. For anyone who wants, um, like a one-on-one -on -one meeting to talk more about the community public fairness fund, please feel free to email me. Um, I've been really heading Wetlands Watch's effort on the outreach to do and to get and help uh, localities apply for the community public fairness fund, and I have so many documents that tracks everything specifically for it. So I, I'd love, I'd love to help any localities who's interested in learning more and apply. I see some things in the chat. Daryl said flood resilience projects this time, planning capacity studies last time. Brady said also feel free to send any CFPF related questions to CFPF at dcr.virginia.gov and one of our flood planning program planners would be happy to assist you. Yes. We have that in analysis on the fact sheet. Great, so we'll keep moving. Risk rating 2.0. Um, so quick updates on risk rating 2.0. Risk rating 2.0 goes live this Friday, April 1st for all policyholders. So as you all recall, um, back in October, October 1st of 2021, any policies created on October 1st or after October 1st. Oh, someone, oh. I think I'm good now. There was some feedback a little bit for a second. Um, for, uh, excuse me, on October, if any policies created through the NFIP um, on October 1st or after October 1st were made with this new rating system, but now with the April 1st update, any policies that are created, or excuse me, that renew on or after April 1st will also have the new rating methodology applied to their rates. So just as a quick update, because I know that Mary Carson has gone over this in a previous meeting, um, the current or the previous rating methodology was based largely around the flood insurance rate maps, the firms. Um, and base flood elevation, foundation type and structural elevation, it was mainly just coming from FEMA source data. Um, now with the new risk rating 2.0 methodology, it's supposed to be a more encompassing um, equitable rating methodology. So it's going to include FEMA source data, additional third party and federal government um, data. It's going to include the full cost to rebuild a structure. It's going to include distance to the flooding source. So whether that's the coast, the ocean or the river river class, the flood type. So it's going to also include flooding um, created through increased rainfall, ground elevation, first floor height, construction type, foundation type, a broader range of flood frequencies. So once again, not just that 100 year floodplain, but also the 500 year floodplain. Um, so it's going to just really encompass a much larger amount of variables. So what the real goal that FEMA is trying to um, achieve here is to create more personalized rates based on where your home is and how your home is built. So a lot of those, um, a lot of, for Virginia, at least 45% of, or is it, excuse me, for on a na national scale, 45% of policies are to see an immediate decrease. So they're not, so it's decreases and increases that are happening um, based on um, this risk rating 2.0 methodology. I see, William, you have your hand up. Yes, so um, in what is extremely anecdotal evidence in our town, we're seeing highly variable changes that don't seem to make 
any sense in terms of there being like common factors that, that relate to those. Is there a way to find out like locality wide, you know, from a government point of view? So to be able to see how much of our town is going up and what, what areas those rate changes are for so we can understand whether those changes actually relate to what we're seeing in terms of our perception of risk? Yeah, I'm not sure if there is a locality specific um, up or down website yet. I know that there are state specific ones. So there's one for Virginia, which I can share that website. Your, um, what your anecdotal, what you're citing is not uncommon. We have heard that there is some, uh, some differences between like what should be happening with people's rates and what has been told about what should be happening with people's rates. So we really encourage people to reach out to their insurance agent to try and correct those if there does seem to be um, some errors there, but we can reach out and talk individually as well about that. But you are, you are not alone in that struggle. Yeah, what we're trying to figure out is holistically, as far as, as we're looking to redevelop our, you know, portion, whole portions of town, uh, mm -hmm. whether or not this is going to be um, a help or a major hindrance on our redevelopment plans. Um, but right now we're just sort of having to ask, like literally like you run into somebody on the street and you ask them, but that's a horribly inefficient way for a government to have to understand, you know, what's mm -hmm. going on with FEMA. So we're, we're looking for some, something smaller than the statewide piece because that's, that's not really of any use to us. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, Tom just reminded me, I didn't want to say this because I couldn't quite remember, but Tom just confirmed for me, um, they do have it down to the zip code level. So you can get everything within that zip code. So I, I, I thought there was, but I didn't want to say it without being sure. So that, that could be provided, that could be helpful. I, I imagine that there's going to be more and more similar anecdotes to your experience after this Friday. So it's going to be interesting to see how it rolls out but we can get that website to you. I need to look it up, but I'll make sure to send it out once we send out these slides as well. Um, great, and, and if I could just follow up with one more thing, any ways sort of to help us lia uh, have a liaison with some FEMA representatives, because unfortunately they interact at the county level and we don't have enough county level land to really draw the county's interest significantly. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of asleep um, as far as this topic goes, but for our locality, it's incredibly impactful. So, you know, because you know, our county is largely agricultural inland lands and we are, you know, very much on the, on the edge. So um, if there's a way to sort of interface, you know, without sort of expecting the county to, to pull the weight on this, that would be good, a good understanding. Yeah, absolutely. No, we'll, that... sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying thank you. Okay, yes, we'll get, we'll, like I said, we'll see how to streamline um, the connections there. I know, so let me, let me continue with this update and we can, maybe we'll have some more questions on it before I uh, wrap this up. But, um, oh, here we go, here are the numbers. Oh, so it is in particular into Virginia. So this is what the numbers look like. These are all, all of these numbers are coming from FEMA. These are the assumed estimates of what Virginia is going to experience the risk rating 2.0. So once again, 45% of policyholders are anticipated to see immediate decreases on their rates. 48% of policyholders are expected to see increases of $12 to $120 annually. 5% of policyholders are expected to see $120 to $240 annual increases. And then 2% of policyholders are anticipated to see increases of anywhere from $240 or more annually. All of these increases are subject to congressional rate cap. So if it's your primary residence, it's an 18% rate cap. And then if it's a secondary residence, a commercial property, an investment property, or a severe repetitive loss property, even if it is your primary residence, it is subject to that 25% rate cap. So it can't go up any more than 18 to 25% um, due to those rate caps, but it's important to know um, that 45% of those policyholders are anticipated to see immediate decreases. Let me continue. A clarify a question about that. So does that, is that slide supposed to show that that's the total increase over time or that's the total increase in one year? Total How do I read that slide? Total increase in one year. 
So the way that this should be read is that ooh, full, so FEMA, this is also all FEMA data. So 25% of um, policies within the first, so let me back up for a second. FEMA is adjusting these rates in hopes that it captures the full risk rate of each property. So it's supposed to encapsulate the real risk that that property has to flooding. So over time, there'll be increases to these properties based to adjust on their full risk rate. So in year one, FEMA anticipates that 25% of properties will realize their full risk rate. By year five, 50% of properties are supposed to see their full risk rate and then by year 10, nearly 90% of those properties are supposed to realize their full risk rate. Something that we haven't gotten a lot of fee feedback on from FEMA is that how this will change because obviously risk is a moving target. So as sea levels rise, as development continues in the floodplain, those risks can increase. So a property, let's say that is supposed to see their full risk rate by year seven, maybe that projection moves up to year 12 because the risk has grown due to certain variables. So we haven't gotten a lot of information on FEMA yet on how that moving target is really going to be estimated, but right now they've told us that 90% of properties will realize their full risk rate by year 10. Does that help answer your question, William? You are muted, or I don't know if you're muted, but I cannot hear you. Yes, it did. That helps. Thank you. Okay, great. So risk rating 2.0 resources. Um, Wetlands Watch has a risk rating 2.0 tracking site, which includes a lot of frequently asked questions. It includes the slides from FEMA's um, presentation on risk rating 2.0. So it has more of these percentages in case you all are interested in seeing what the national impacts of risk rating 2.0 are. Wetlands Watch created two videos. So we have, and if there's time at the end of today, we can show it, but I wanna give all the localities times to do report outs. But if there's um, time, we can show it. It's a, a video of risk rating 2.0 explained and it kind of really breaks down um, how this rating methodology is going to change insurance rates under the National Flood Insurance Program. It's about 10 minutes long. And then we have a second video, it's about five minutes, and it talks about the specific impacts that are coming to Virginia for risk rating 2.0. Um, we also have our Commonwealth Resilience Brief. It's our e-newsletter. So if you all want to get updates as we get them from FEMA, that's the best way to get more media updates. Um, and then we also continuously update that risk rating 2.0 tracking site. All of these things are hyperlinked in the presentation and like I said, when we send this presentation out, you all will be able to click on these. So I'm gonna launch the risk rating 2.0 poll. And while I do that, is there any questions, any more questions in the room or online about risk rating 2.0? I have a quick one. I know um, the whole 2.0 is new and um, there's been a lot of work on that stuff, but has there been any discussion that you're aware of of how um, measures like this elevation of homes in the floodplain would affect um, the new flood insurance numbers. I assume that this data would become available as yep. we go further into implementation, but are you aware of any discussion of that? So how that affects specific people's flood insurance rates? Um, so something that is concerning that we've been hearing from, I'm not sure if it's insurance agents and, or real estate agents or both. I think it's actually insur insurance agents. Um, initiatives that homeowners can do like flood vents, home elevations, things of that nature used to account for about 90% of, um, like flood insurance deductions on their rates. And now we're seeing under risk rating 2.0, it can only go up to 5%. Deductions, which is obviously concerning, and it's one of our main questions for FEMA when it comes to risk rating 2.0, because if homeowners can't get a significant decrease by doing things that will help protect their home, where is the fiscal and um, 
incentive for them to do that if they don't even get significant decreases for doing those actions. So yes, we have heard, and it's not great, but it's one of those questions that we haven't gotten answered by FEMA yet. So like anecdotally, we're doing six home elevation projects yep. once, and um, we have a homeowner needs. That is the first question that every homeowner asks us and um, is primarily yes. why um, residents voluntarily want yeah. to participate um, in, the, in the FEMA program. So. Yes, it's really difficult. Once again, we'll get more data after these policies start to renew after the April 1st date, but yes, it is a big concern of ours and it's something we haven't gotten answered from FEMA yet. Um, it's on, if you look at our tracking page, we have a tab that says unknowns and that's the biggest one of why that's happening. And all of this data is kind of like anecdotally yeah. of what we gained, but obviously that's a big difference, 90% and 5%. Um, I see that we have two people who said yes to our, is there any other information you need regarding risk rating 2.0? So if the two people who answered yes to that question don't mind, or if you wanna unmute, or if um, you wanna add it in the chat, what other information would be helpful? This is Will Knuckles from Colonial Beach again. So I think yep. the underlying uh -huh. confusion that we have is that Apparently, there's a new risk methodology based on a model that nobody's been able to see that indicates that there are things that are riskier than the flood maps would indicate. And our local ordinances are tied to flood risk based on flood maps. So how do we understand the new sort of insurance rates? Because it's kind of telling us that our, our basis of doing development sort of controls based on flood maps is probably not accurate mm -hmm. um, and that they've got some better methodology but it's a methodology they don't seem to be sharing so this, this sort of leaves us confused as to what FEMA product we should look to when we're trying to decide you know how to control development in a risky area yeah absolutely we'll add that to our our list of things that's definitely a concern like you said no one has seen the back end methodology, because once again, the new methodology is based not only on FEMA data, but third party data and other federal government data. And no one has seen on the back end what all of that integrated together looks like. So um, that, that's a really good point. What are you all supposed to look to for your local zoning ordinance to try and uh, cor correlate it to those if you can't see what it looks like? So I'll add that as well. Any other? Um, questions, comments, concerns that we can take as we start connecting with FEMA, either in the room or online. Great, so like I said, we'll keep you all updated on risk rating 2.0. Obviously, hopefully we'll get some more answers and data as policies start to renew after this Friday, because it'll be a much bigger change. Let's see, Brian said, I don't think anything about risk rating 2.0 changes any of the NFIP minimum standards. Yes, correct. So risk rating 2.0 doesn't change anything about the NFIP minimum standards. Like I said, that RFI is separate from this, but it affects people's insurance rates so that the regulatory arm of the NFIP is not changing. It's just the insurance rate part of the NFIP. And we are one of um, the things that one of the bigger updates that's prevalent to the CRS work group is that now under risk rating 2.0, and this is a good update, is that all um, for CRS communities who are getting deductions based off their class level, those um, benefits can now be um, utilized by all of the people in the community. So that's really great. So those um, benefits are shared wider throughout your community, um, not just within the SFHA. Um, but on the flip side of that, we do not know how risk rating 2.0 is going to change the CRS scores and activities. Cause obviously some of the things like once again, since home elevations don't seem to be factoring in such a large deduction into the rates, what does that do on the flip side to the CRS community scores? So we haven't heard anything about that yet, but we're following it very closely. 
One more piece from uh, from Colonial Beach. Are y'all tracking this holistically as a group for asking for legislative briefings from the Hill, or, or are we sort of doing this locality by locality? Um, in terms of how it's an impacting people. Uh, no, just having that, trying to have a dialogue with you know our legislators, our, our federal legislators, um, and trying to coordinate questions and concerns and, and asking for sort of just an information dialogue back and forth between the feds on the elected side. Um, are we sort of all on our own? Are we all doing our own thing or is there a sort of a, a group effort to try to streamline the information flow? Uh, we haven't created a group effort, but we absolutely can. I mean, I think this is a big concern to this group in particular, so we can absolutely do that. I know when Wetlands Watch met with Congressman Bobby Scott, uh, I think that was September of last year, he didn't know risk rating 2.0 was happening. And then when we told him about um, that the program hadn't been updated to the 1970s and what's going to happen, he was he was very surprised. So I think if we want to have a group initiative to talk to officials, I, I think that'd be a great idea. So we can definitely get together on that. Yeah. Thomas Coghill said, we've talked about making this a regional group effort. Yeah, absolutely. We can do that for sure. And I think if we can stay connected on how the other anecdotal evidence that you all are picking up from different homeowners or your communities on how this is affecting their rates, that would be great too. Because I think if we're able to provide specific evidence, that's all the better. Yeah, absolutely. Kathy and I citizen uh, meeting uh, for the community and social group, which is very sensitive to the uh, flood floodplain. And um, is it our question is, is the flood risk too poor? Is it um, our responsibility to um, bring the awareness to the citizen or something that insurance company has to do with? So from my understanding, it is the insurance company. So you all don't have to do it. The flood, when they renew their rate, they'll see it on their bill, how risk rating 2.0 is affecting their renewal rate. Renewal rates typically happen um, when you close on your house. So it's like not every, so something that's important to know is that not everyone's getting a new bill this Friday. They're getting their new bill whenever their house renews, uh, or excuse me, when their insurance rate renews. So if they closed on their house and got their flood insurance, say June 16th, that's when they'll get their new rate. They're not gonna, not everyone's gonna automatically get it on April 1st. So they'll get that from their insurance company. But I would say that it's not a bad idea to talk to your community members in advance and go ahead and start putting out this information. So when June 16th rolls around for that homeowner, they're like, we didn't prepare for this because once again, some homeowner, homeowners are seeing significant increases. So if they're budgeting, they might not be prepared for their rate to go up by $240 a year. So once again, it's only 2% of homeowners. So it's not a significant amount. Once again, 45% of people are seeing decreases. So maybe it'll be better. Um, if, home, they, if homeowners are able to talk to their insurance agent and actually calculate what their rate would be under risk rating 2.0, and they know that it would decrease, they are able to go ahead and renew their policy to go ahead and see those decreased rates too. So if you know someone who um, used to be like a preferred risk policy or a homeowner that should have, like you've had discussions with them, they should have lower rates on their flood insurance, um, you can uh, talk with them and you can have them talk to their insurance agent and maybe they can go ahead and get all of insurance. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, let's see. Uh, FEMA hazard mitigation grant update. So kind of in that same breath, we wanted to make sure everyone was aware of this. FEMA has updated their pre-calculated benefits for acquisition and home elevation projects. So this is really important because if your community is applying for FEMA hazard mitigation assistance grant and you're trying to do home elevations or home acquisitions, um, 
in order to apply for these grants, you usually have to do a benefit cost analysis. But with these pre-calculated benefits, FEMA has already done like what the minimum benefit pre-calculated benefit is. So if you know that a home acquisition project that you're looking at doing um, is $323,000 or less, you automatically get that check mark on your benefit cost analysis from FEMA. So it's increasing. It used to be $276,000. It has now increased to $323,000 for home acquisition projects. And then for home elevation projects, it used to be $175,000 and it is now increased to $205,000. So that's really important for folks to know. Yes. Um, I just want to say that this is for the total cost of the project. Um, process of updating our budget for some of our acquisitions and verified that this include not just the sale of the home, but any M and A and anything like that. Yeah, that's really important. Thank yeah. you for making that note. So maybe not quite as much as we would hope, but it's still a really good increase that's happening. Any questions about this or other comments? Great, I think this was our last update. So we can go ahead and go around and do work uh, group attendee report outs. So let's go ahead and do um, the folks in the room. So does anyone have any Updates um, regards to new actions or activities that your locality is trying to do to get CRS points for, or um, anything pertinent to the group. Yeah, go ahead. Mike Wilson from Jane City County. Uh, we are exploring uh, moving up in class. Um, I've talked to MC briefly about it, um, and I need to get up with Emily. Uh, Cover it a little bit. Um, also, I'm not sure it's 100% uh, relevant, but the county is also now a uh, the owner of another high hazard den from DCR dam safety standpoint. <laughs> it's in the club, yeah. <laughs> our, uh, our service authority so graciously gave uh, donated the uh, property to us, so we do need to thank them as well. <laughs> Gotcha. What, um, what class are you trying to move up to? Uh, we're currently a five, so it would be either a four or a three. Oh my goodness, that's great news. Wow. Do, you, do you mind just voting what um, activities in particular you're trying to? We need to meet the prerequisites for a four. We already have the points. Okay. Um, and specifically, it's watershed planning or uh, I, for, I forget exactly which class uh, activity code it is. Great. Um, but I did talk to Daryl Cook, who, um, okay. as people, old timers in this group now, uh, used to be CRS coordinator for the James City County. Yep. Um, and he uh, he suggested it might be a tough road to hoe. Um, and uh, MC kind of gave me that impression as well. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's and great. Emily, did you hear that? I'm trying to get a James City County from five to three. Yeah, um, and, and yes, that activity 450 watershed master plan is the, the prerequisite that seems to be the, um, the last prerequisite earned for moving from a class five to class four, um, because it, it's just following all of those steps that are outlined in the manual. But if you uh, want to reach out to me, we can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion about um, where things are, or if you want me to set something up with our technical reviewers for that particular activity, um, for any focused questions you may have, we can work on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, get up with you on for a one-on-one. -on -one. I'll, uh, I'll send you an email here shortly. Excellent. Great. Anyone else in the room? Updates? I will call on your individual. Great, folks online, do we have any updates? You can put them this in the Matt Allen from DCR. Um, just an update on the Coast Resilience Master Plan and the statewide master plan. Um, we're still in a holding pattern, uh, awaiting further direction and seeing what comes out of this uh, final stages of the General Assembly. So I wish we had more to say, more definitive action, but uh, we're still here waiting to get our direction to proceed. But if you have any questions or need data from what we've already done, please uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for joining today. 
Nice to have someone on from DCR on the call. Anyone else online? I see Tom put no updates from Accomac. Christy said James City County was covered by Mike. Yeah. I do have another thing. I will be talking with a uh, uh, student from UVA and their uh, advisor on our open space preservation uh, program. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, and that's going to occur next week. Great. Is that open to the public or? Uh, <laughs> not, not at this time, but <laughs> let's, uh, I think last time we met, uh, MC had said some uh, asked for uh, localities that might be interested in sharing their experiences. So yeah, um, they finally gave me, uh, finally contacted me last week. Oh, oh, oh I see. Sorry. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Any other? Oh, oh, go ahead. Will Knuckles from uh, Town of Colonial Beach. So we are beginning a uh, the beginning of what we believe will be a resilience plan for the town. Although to be at the moment, we're still trying to scope out what that exactly will mean for us. And we're doing that at a time we're a little bit hamstrung because we are working with an interim planning director. So we are on the hunt for a director for our planning office. So if anybody knows anyone who would be interested mm -hmm. in a job, particularly one that has this portfolio as part of their background, we would love to hear from them. Great. Thank you. Are you asking where you, oh, oh, I see. Any other updates? Oh, Norfolk received CFPF funding to draft a CRS watershed master plan, kicking off soon. Great. Matt, did you want to talk any more about that? Um, not really. Uh, <laughs> just, just going through the process of, of receiving the, the funding, um, and then we'll be kicking off with a consultant soon. So we're excited Great. about it and hopefully trying to also meet that class four prereq. Awesome. Interested to see how that process goes for y'all. Yeah. Great, great, thank you. Anyone else online? Okay. Great, so we do have time to share that risk rating 2.0 video that Mary Carson and I created. So if, oh, excuse me, hold on. Daryl said no Petersburg updates other than CFPF previously mentioned. Okay, so I'll go ahead and share that. Um, if folks have another meeting they need to get to, um, they are more than welcome to stay and watch or go if they need to. But I wanted to go ahead and give people the opportunity to watch that. And if there's any more questions based on the information in the video, um, they can ask. So let me go ahead and do that. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Madison, one other comment from DCR. Yep. Um, Post Resilience Master Plan, we went out to 2080 in the actual plan document, but since then, um, Dewberry has done the projections out to 2100. Yep. Um, so we have that data. It is using the 2017 projections, not the newest 2022 projections. Um, but we're working on making that data available so uh, localities can use that. I think that may be a requirement for that uh, watershed management plan going out to 2100, looking at it, but that another data set that uh, should be available later this year. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that, Matt. Sorry, I had someone come up and speak to me. You were just saying that the data is gonna be more inclusive to include till 2100? Yes, we did additional data out to 2100. Okay, great. No, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, I've got another question for you, please. Just realized I was muted. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a continuing education credit verification form for ASFPM. Um, will you be sending in 
the the roster that attended today to to ASFPM? To yes. So as long as you've answered all of the poll questions online, uh, you will be receiving your continuing education credits. Awesome. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Of course. All right. Moving over back to YouTube. Let's see. When I'm not signed into our YouTube page, how fun is that? Hi, my name is Mary. All right, hold on. I need to. I'm going to stop sharing for a second so I can make sure the audio is being shared through my computer so folks online can hear it okay. We did hear that little snippet of when she started talking. Yeah, yep. I just wanted to, I can optimize the sound so it sounds better for you all. Great. Let's see. Mary Carson Stiff, and I'm a certified floodplain manager at Wetlands Watch. I want to tell you about a huge change that's coming to the National Flood Insurance Program, effective April 1st, 2022. This change is called Risk Rating 2.0. FEMA has modified how they're calculating flood insurance annual rates. This update is really necessary because the rating methodology has not changed since the 1970s. Here's the gist. The cost of flood insurance is increasing because the flood risk is increasing nationally. FEMA is using way better and more sophisticated data to determine the specific flood risk of an individual structure. FEMA is also making sure that some policyholders are not overpaying any longer for insurance, while also eliminating the grandfathering of policies. This will make the flood insurance program much more solvent. The impact nationally is that policyholders are going to begin to pay their full risk rate. What does this mean? Again, this is a national um, percentage. 23% of policies are going to decrease in costs annually, while 77% will increase. No policy on a primary residence will increase more than 18% each year, and no policy on a secondary or an investment structure will increase more than 25% each year. These increased maximums are leftover congressional rate caps from the Bigert Waters and Grim Waters legislation uh, back in 2013 and 2015. So let's talk about what the old rating system used to be. Old flood insurance rates were based on the zones as determined by FEMA's flood insurance rate maps, flood elevation projections within each individual flood zone, and building characteristics such as the foundation type and how high the structure is built above that flood projection elevation. Variable rates were really only set for structures located in the highest flood risk zones, also known as the 100-year flood zone, or the zones that have a 1% annual chance of flooding. If a structure has a federally backed mortgage and is located in one of these zones, then flood insurance is required. This fact of mandatory flood insurance um, is, real, is still effective today and will continue under this new change. If a property was located outside of these high risk flood zones, an elective flood insurance policy could be purchased. These were called preferred risk policies or PRPs and they were generally around $500 even if they were located right next to a structure 
that was required to carry flood insurance because it was located in one of those high risk zones. All right, so that was the old rating system. Let's talk about risk rating 2.0. The new rates are no longer based on the flood zones from the flood insurance rate maps. That's really the biggest change that you should know. Rates are now including multiple risk factors that are more structure specific. The goal is for policyholders to begin paying the full risk rate. So the new rates are based on the following characteristics. New and higher resolution projected risk data that includes a broader range of flood frequencies. The specific type of flood source for the structure, such as heavy rainfall, river class, or amount of storm surge. The structure's distance to a flooding source, such as a river, the ocean, or a bay. The structure's first floor elevation and foundation type. And this is really because it indicates whether or not the structure has the ability to withstand flooding without being damaged. And then finally, FEMA is including the full cost to rebuild a structure into the rate. This is really important to get at that equity issue that FEMA is trying to address. It helps remedy the problem where under the old system, two properties with the exact same flood risk, but a 2,000 square foot differential would be paying the exact same annual rate. So this is dealing with this unfair um, financial burden on property owners of much smaller um, structures with far less value. Because the new rating methodology is not based on flood zones, there is no such thing as preferred risk policies anymore. So no PRPs. Additionally, those previously grandfathered policies will no longer be subsidized and new rates will be calculated based on this new rating methodology. So when does this new risk rating 2.0 go into effect? If you started a new policy on or after October 1st of 2021, it was written using the new rating method. This new policy was a full risk rate. The new rates are effective for everybody on April 1st, 2022. So if you have a policy um, that you've had with the National Flood Insurance Program for a year or more, you're going to start to see these new rates be phased in. This does not mean that you will get a new bill on April 1st of this year. Your bill will show the change when your policy renews. This is generally when you closed on your property when you first purchased it. If a new policy is initiated, it will be at full risk rate. So if you are selling your house, um, a new buyer would need to start paying what the flood insurance would cost at its full risk rate for your structure that you're trying to sell. If you are going to sell, a new buyer may be able to assume your existing policy, thereby locking in that capped 18 or 25% annual increase. Um, which would be a really good option if you are looking to sell your property. I would just advise that you ask your agent for more information. So what are some frequently asked questions that Wetlands Watch has been receiving regarding risk rating 2.0? We've heard what kind of costs should we expect? According to FEMA, no policy will cost more than $12,125 annually in the first year of risk rating 2.0 which is far less than the highest annual policy under the old methodology, which was almost $46,000. When will policies reach their full risk rates? So 25% of all policies in the National Flood Insurance Program will be paying their full risk rate in year one. 50% of all policies will pay the full risk rate by year five and 90% by year 10. 
so those incremental 18 and 25 percent capped increases will for the most part stop um, by year 10. Note, unfortunately, a property's full risk rate seems to be a moving target from what we can understand about the FEMA data and the rollout. This full risk rate could be subject to increases over time. FEMA has not provided any specific data on how the changes will happen and when. What are the impacts to the community rating system or the CRS program? This is one of our favorite questions because it has one of the most positive responses and answers. One of the best outcomes of risk rating 2.0 is that all flood insurance policyholders are now going to be eligible to receive the CRS discounts on premiums annually that are earned by participating CRS communities. This means bigger benefits and better distribution of those premium discounts across the community. We do not have data yet on how the total CRS savings per community will change under risk rating 2.0, but we are going to monitor this issue very closely and provide that new updated data to local governments as soon as we have it. Learn more about the CRS program and whether your community participates on Wetlands Watch's website. Finally, we just want to recognize that Risk Rating 2.0 is a massive overhaul of a program that hasn't been updated in 50 years. There will be some challenges with the rollout, and we may not know all the answers, and FEMA may not know all the answers. So please just follow us for updates on Wetlands Watch's website, and we will be tracking um, the rollout very closely and provide updates as we know them. Thanks so much. Great. So Mary Carson's at the meeting, even though she wasn't here. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. So once again, we do have a Virginia specific related um, YouTube video as well as on Wetlands Watches YouTube, if you all are interested in watching that. Once again, it had, breaks down more of the, what Mary Carson was talking about were the national average percentages of the increases and decreases. So Virginia is faring better compared to um, national in, estimated decreases and increases. Once again, nationally, they're only estimated to be 23% um, decreases, whereas there are gonna be 45% decreases within the state of Virginia. And then compared to other coastal states like the Carolinas, Louisiana, Florida, um, our decreases are much more substantial than theirs, which is a good thing. Um, so if anyone has any more questions on risk rating 2.0, please feel free to email myself or Mary Carson about it. And particularly if you have any other questions that we haven't, haven't come up today or um, aren't addressed already on our webpage that's tracking this issue, issue, please let us know and we'll try and connect with someone um, at FEMA about it. Great. Are there any other questions about that before I log off? I just want to give people space, but thank you all so much for staying on and watching that video. Really appreciate it. Oh, I see some. Let me look at the chat. Oh, there's a direct message in there, so I don't want to pull that up because every. Uh, it was just asking about the paper slides. Oh, can we get a link to that video? Yes. One moment. Once again, the links will be posted within the presentation uh, or within the slides so you all can click on it automatically. Thank you, thank you. Fun fact in Alexandria, repetitive lost properties in 2018, 10. Repetitive lost properties in 2022, 38, wow. Great. Um, if there are no more questions or anything of that, uh, oh, let me make sure. I think there's still a poll running, actually. Let me close that out and poll so you all get your um, credit for that. And that was our last poll. So everyone online, thank you all so much for joining. I'll hang around a bit online if anyone has questions, but I hope you all um, have a great rest of your day and week, and we'll see you back here in May. Um, Emily. Great. And then for those of y'all in person, thank y'all for sticking around too. If y'all have anything you want to discuss, feel free to thank come you. on up.